Sometimes basic is best. Now, you can tell me how Instagrammable that a salted caramel, banoffee flavoured gelato is, but just give me a double scoop of vanilla with a chocolate flake in it and I'm quite happy. Same goes when you go to one of these coffee aporiums with your double macchiato with steamed, whipped, whatever and all the rest of it. Actually, I'll just take mine strong and black if it's all the same to you. And yes, of course, what's nicer than being in a five-star resort in the Maldives and a lovely sort of like, you know, summer holiday, but do you know what? Give me a nice sort of like Sherpa hut on a Cornish hillside and some cider and some fish and chips. I'm quite happy to be honest with you. But does the same apply to cars? Because when it comes to family cars, we do tend to default towards our premium badged tech laden SUVs that you can be seen outside any school gate. But surely a family car just needs to be spacious, versatile, reasonably cheap to buy, cheap to run, and will handle pretty much everything that a family can throw at it. And if that is the case, then why should you look past something like the Dacia Jogger? Welcome back to this week's new car review from Sunny Cornwall. Welcome to the Dacia Jogger Hybrid 140. And as always, welcome to House of Cars. Now, before I get started on this week's road test review of the Dacia Jogger Hybrid 140, it would be remiss of me not to ask you to make sure that you're subscribed to the House of Cars channel. Then once you've done that, press the wee bell button down below because that's the way you'll get notified when our next video is uploaded and it's gone live. Once you've watched it, if you enjoy it, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And please don't forget, leave me your thoughts in the comments section down below. Let me know what you think about the cars that are reviewing House of Cars. And of course, on the channel as a whole, and if you've maybe got any suggestions of cars you'd like to see me look at. So let me know down in the comments section. Right, uh, another little caveat to just let you know. First of all, it's quite windy here. I'm up on top of this lovely Cornish kind of hillside, so apologies if there's a bit of wind noise on the old um, microphone there. Dacia, uh, Romanian company founded in 1966 as an alliance between Renault uh, and the then uh, government of uh, Romania, which was Nicolae Ceausescu's. Ooh, bad man. Um, but in 1999, bought completely by Renault. So they bought completely under the Renault uh, group arm, if you like, from there and they were introduced into the UK in 2013. Um, they've been a sort of purveyor of, I, I want to be careful what I say here, kind of budget back to basic sorts of cars, maybe using sort of like last of the old sort of like Renault tech. But as they've kind of moved forward and kind of become sort of like more well known, we're seeing a lot more development within Dacia itself, you know, their own design department, their own technology. And whilst there is still a lot of Renault technology used in the car, which is a good thing and a bad thing maybe in some respects, um, they are starting to stand on their own two feet very, very well and get a real name for themselves. But that name is being built on that, did I suggest, more kind of, I'm not going to say budget, but more that kind of better value for money style of car. We've already seen some brilliance from them in things like the Duster, the small sort of like, you know, inexpensive four before crossover car that they have. And this car's predecessor, the Logan, uh, and of course, the brilliant uh, Sandero, the little sort of, you know, uh, B-segment Super Mini that they've been producing. But this is their first hybrid model. And obviously, as we're moving towards electrification, this could be quite an important car for Dacia. So what do we think? Now, before we start on the actual road test, let's take a look at the main points about the Jogger Hybrid 140. So the car is an additional model in the popular and well-regarded Jogger range, and is the brand's first hybrid production model. It's powered by a 1.6 litre normally aspirated engine that pairs with an electric motor to provide electric assistance and a combined power output of 140 brake horsepower. It also has a 1.2 kilowatt hour battery that can allow the car to drive from a small distance from electric power only. The Jogger has seven seats with a hybrid model available in two different trim levels. And prices start at 22995 and go up to 23995 before options. Which is about three to three and a half thousand pounds more than the non-hybrid Jogger. So it is a little bit more expensive than that, but it's still thousands of pounds less than similar seven seat electrified MPVs. But is it worth your consideration? Time to find out. Right, let's start with the styling of the car. 
What do we think? Well, I, what is it? I mean, is it an estate car? Is it an SUV? Is it a crossover? Is it an MPV? Goodness knows, but I tell you what, I think it's a good looking car, irrespective of how you view it. I like the fact that it doesn't kind of conform, it doesn't fit into a particular segment. And I think Dacia have done really, really well in kind of making it stand out um, because of that. They're getting a real, uh, they're getting their house in order when it comes to styling as well. You know, gone are the kind of days where they were just like, just basic looking cars. I think they look really good now. And if I like the, the duster as it is at the moment, but the new duster that's coming out looks phenomenal, I think. And the Jogger, I think is a great looking car. I really, really like it. And loads of people have commented on it, especially in this color, which I think is khaki green from memory. I think it is. It's a really nice kind of almost, I think it's a flat color, it's, but it's a really nice kind of green. And loads of people have said how much they like the, the look of the car in this color. Right, new, big new bold Dacia logo here. I think I think it's meant to be a D and a C in the white, but I really like that. That's nice. And of course, you get the kind of bits that kind of spear through the kind of grill there. Um, y shaped DRLs there, and and their LED headlamps as well. The, the headlamps are actually quite good. You know, running around the kind of lanes of Cornwall at night, um, I have to say that they've been really, really good and welcome. You've also got the lower kind of front uh, fogs down there as well. And obviously you've got a bit of cooling down there and there's a radar sensor there. No front facing camera on this one, but there is a reversing camera. We'll talk about trims and prices a bit later on. But basically there's two trim levels within the, the, the hybrid model, although there's three in the non-hybrid model. So the, the, the hybrid doesn't get the basic essential model. You either have the Expression, which this one is, or the Extreme. And I have to say I really like the extreme um, with sort of you know the alloys and the kind of gloss black bits and pieces on it and a bit bronze through it. So that's nice. But even so, this is a really nice looking car, I think. But wait till you see the rest of it, because I think it's a yeah, I think it's quirky and I really like it. And what I like about it is they've just kind of thought about how people use cars and don't put anything silly on it. I mean, okay, you get your body cladding around it, you know, the, the, the black plastic body cladding, which is very welcome down here in Cornwall with the kind of narrow lanes and kind of spiky hedges that you sometimes have to pull into to let somebody pass. So that has been a welcome a bonus. It is very dirty as you can see because I am on a family holiday at the moment. We brought it down on a family holiday and uh, it's been put to the test and I'll talk about that in the practicality side of it. But look what I'm talking about here. These aren't alloy wheels, these are wheel trims. There's steel wheels behind there, but they look like alloys. They've designed them to look like alloys and that's brilliant just really practical. You move up to the extreme and you get alloys, by the way. These are 16 inch wheels, uh, these. These are 205 60R16s, Hankook tires. It's a front wheel drive car only as well. There's no all wheel drive jogger available. You want four wheel drive, you move up to the duster, but you don't really need it in fairness. Uh, this is what I was talking about. See these integrated roof rails? These are brilliant because what you can do is you can, you get a tool where you can just unclip these and put them transverse across to fit bike racks on it and, and roof racks, brilliant. So you don't have to buy additional crossbars. What a clever solution. Why doesn't more manufacturers do that? That's a phenomenally clever thing because, you know, we've had to go and buy roof bars for our family car, our Grand Cherokee. That's a great idea. You can buy loads of other stuff for it as well. We'll go into packs and things, but you can buy things like sleep packs in it. You can turn the back of it into sort of like a, in fact, there's a chap that's just come along and said, could you use it for a festival? There's your car. Uh, right, big chunky uh, body colour door handles, the nice kind of body coloured mirrors, there's blind spot assist, you get the little um, illumination up there in the mirror as well for your blind spot indicator. And it's a nice bits of body cladding around the car. Privacy glass standard on the car as well, which is nice. And then round the back, the big tall tail lights. But as I say, there's nothing superfluous, no silly design for a praise, nothing that's not needed, just honest, practical, well thought out design in my opinion. And I like that. And as we move around the back, there's more of this thoughtful design with no fripperies on it. A little bit of Volvo influence there. Can you see that? I think, you know, from the XC90. My sister-in-law is an XC70. Very, very similar, I think, with the tall kind of tail lights up and down the rear pillar. And then you get the kind of Y shape design in there for the reverse lights and the, the, the turn signals. It's a very upright back. So again, that's adding to the practicality of the car because I see, remember, it's a seven seater. So, but we'll, we'll go on to practicality in a minute. Uh, I can see big white Dacia lettering across the back and the new designer lettering, which again is really, really nice. Rear white wiper obviously, you do get a uh, wash wiper as I say, there's a wash up there, you get a uh, high level brake light mounted there and there is a camera just mounted in there um, and when you open the tailgate it comes right down to bumper level, talking to bumper, 
proper big black plastic bumper. So when you're backing up against things, you've got the reverse camera, you've got the reverse and sensors, but if all of that fails, you've not got a painted bumper that you're going to whack and scratch up. Um, just stickers for the badges. There's no, you know, apart from the Dacia loitering there, you know, you don't get any superfluous badges. You get Jogger and you see it's the hybrid there. So, as I said, nothing um, superfluous, nothing that's not needed, just a well thought out piece of design focusing on practicality and how people actually use the car. And it's things like that that I really like in car design. When somebody really sits down and says, who's our customer? Who are we looking at this car for? And designing it for those people. And I think Dacia are onto a winner with this one, I really do. It's just, it, it, it's almost the anti-SUV SUV, if you like. And I think it's an absolute corking looking thing. But what do you think? Have you got one of the older uh, Logans? Would this tempt you into that? Have you got a duster? Uh, uh, sorry, duster? A jogger. Why did you buy the jogger? Was it looks one of the main things or was it just the practicality of it? Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Now, as I said, the jogger is seven seats, a standard. And if you've got all seven seats in place, then the boot space is 212 litres, which is not huge. I mean, you'd get a couple of duffel bags in there or, dare I suggest, school bags. That's where I think, you know, the, you know, in terms of the boot space, there's enough room in there for kids' school bags, I think, if you've got all of them gone, um, taking them to school. So 212 litres is what you've got with all the seats in place. You can, however, obviously increase this um, by folding the, seat, the rearmost seats uh, down. Now, give me a second here, I'll figure out how this is done. So you flip that one there, pull that tab, and that rolls forward. Oh, oh, he says, there we go. And then this one here, push, fold, pull, and tip that forward. There we go. Right, so now, with the rear seats, the rearmost seats folded, you've now got 699 litres of boot space, which is big, really big. You can remove those seats completely. You can actually unclip those, uh, that third row and just leave them in the garage and just use them when you want to. You've also got a luggage blind, which you can put in place, obviously, and uh, keep things from prying eyes. The problem is, with the luggage cover, he says, if you don't mind looking at my bottom while I do this, it's fine for when it's in place when you've got, but there's nowhere to store it um, when you've got all seven seats in place because it doesn't clip here at the back. That's the only thing. But that space there, 699 litres, is huge. Now you can see it's very sandy and there's a reason for that. And I'm going to show you this. This is our beach trolley. Look at that. I had that stacked the other day with three um, collapsible chairs Buckets, spades, two body boards from a daughter and, and her cousin, and you know a picnic bag, all sorts for a day on the beach. That's huge. That's so practical. Look at the width of that, and also the height is not particularly high. It's just above my knees, and I'm a shorty, so that's a really practical boot to load things into. And whether it's you know a beach trolley like this, dogs. You want to know if you can get your dogs in it? <laughs> Let me show you. Come here. Loads of space for them. My sister-in-law, the XC70, she's got two lurchers and they would go in there easily. And as they're getting a little bit older, they are finding jumping up into the Volvo a little bit more difficult. So that low sill is quite welcome. Now, the only downside with a hybrid is you don't get a spare wheel with it because that's where the small battery lives. So the non-hybrid car has a spare wheel. This one doesn't. Um, the middle bench, so the rear kind of bench in a normal car, has a 60-40 split. And if you push that down, then it takes the total capacity and, and remove those seats because they don't fold any further than that. You've got to take those out. But if you fold that bench further down, then it goes up to just over 2,000 litres of space that you've got in there, which is basically a van. So the main aim of the jogger to provide practicality, as far as I'm concerned, wins, but not just on space, not just on volume, but on the usability of that space, you know, how square it is, how easy it is to kind of load things in and out. You know, there's no back braking kind of sill to lift things over. You know, the tailgate lifts to a, you know, to a good height. Um, you've got also the ability, as I said earlier, and I'll put some B-roll up, you can have a sleep pack in it as well. And I think there's a tent that kind of can clip on the back as well if you want it. There's loads of different options, you know, for doing various different kind of family outdoor activities and stuff like that. But I think this is an incredibly practical car. Yeah, 
Right, up front in the jogger, what have we got to discuss? Well, the first thing that strikes you is actually how well built it is. I mean, don't get me wrong, the plastics are all quite hard, but they don't look it. I know that sounds really odd, but they actually look like they're almost that kind of rubberized kind of plastic, which actually I would prefer. But in fairness, they don't look cheap plastics. It's only when you kind of touch them or, or bang them that you realize what it's like. But it's alleviated by this textured panel across the dashboard and on the doors um, and on the sort of like tops of the seats here, which is really, really nice. And again, it's the kind of the, the kind of basic design of it is down to functionality and everything just works. It's like the normal jogger. Um, the only thing is you've got a, a different digital display to let you know about the hybrid kind of system in here, which I'll, I'll put some B-roll up so you can see it. Um, so if I, hang on, if I start the car up, um, there we go. Straighten the wheel up there. So I got a nice kind of digital display here. I got my really clear uh, speedometer right in front of me. I've got a battery state of charge over on the left, fuel readout on the right. And then round the top of the speedo is just basically, it's not a rev counter, but it says if you're in power or whether it's it's charging. Now, again, I'll talk about uh, the, sort of like the battery on the car when we do the technical side of things, um, but it's not a plug-in hybrid. So it, it uses two electric motors. It's quite a clever system. Uh, there's one that's attached to the engine, there's another one in the gearbox, but I'll try and explain all that when I'm out and about. Oh, hang on, let me just turn that fan speed down a little bit. Um, the only thing I will say, and you can probably hear it, but we'll leave this to the driving section, of, is the engine noise. There we go. Right, back to inside. As I say, everything's designed well. It's basic, but it just works. The kind of design of the kind of grill, you can see there with the white around the you know the sort of like the the air vents here. That's nice. They feel really nice actually. They don't feel too cheap when you move them. They've got these kind of knurled bezels around the aircon uh, controls, which obviously get the digital readouts in the middle, which I do like. And 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 the basic buttons of what you've got. You know, uh, maximum defrost, heated rear screen, air recirculation, and aircon. And then you've got an eco mode there, uh, hazards door lock. Um, and then the rest is controlled through this screen, which I'll come on to in a second. You've got this four-spoke, uh, I don't know whether it's leather or not, whether it's just pleather, some kind of vinyl, but it's quite nice to hold actually, with just enough controls on them. So you've got cruise control on this side, and then you've got things to alter your trip meter on this side. And obviously you've got Bluetooth, which is done through um, the screen as well. Um, down by my right knee, I've got the usual uh, Renault uh, Group uh, audio controls. So rather than having them on the wheel, they've got the separate stock down here. Now I had a Megane E-Tech for three months um, when I was running it on my other channel, Auto EV. If you're into electric cars, by the way, that's what you need to well, that's what you need to watch, Auto EV. Um, and I got used to this really quite well. So it's nice. It's in you just using your fingertips just to sort of like adjust the volume or track search. That's really good. So I do like that. The column stocks, again, you know, as I say from Renault Group, they're really nice. They feel solid. They've got a nice action to them. Uh, and I can't complain about them. They're in the right place. And then the door controls are the same. Adjustable electric door mirrors, four electric windows. Superb. The seats... Seats are great. I have to admit, they look basic, but they are so comfortable. As I say, I did the trip down from Surrey to Cornwall with my uh, father-in-law and mother-in-law the other day, and, and I've been using this car continuously throughout my time here. And I just find the seats great. They've got just the right amount of lateral support down my side and the side of my legs, and I like the length of the squab. I like a lengthy squab. Um, and I must admit, that's what I do like. So th there's a good length of um, squab there to support underneath the knees. Uh, storage, storage is excellent. You get two cup holders there. I get my big Yeti coffee flask and one other coffee flasks are available. And my ocean bottle, water bottle in the back one there, which is good as well. Although it won't quite close that center cubby when that's in there. But you can then store it in the door because there's a shape for a water bottle in each door, which is good. Um, and then storage-wise, there's a, a cubby in here, which as you can see, you can get a pair of sunglasses in and some small snacks. Yeah, it's a Madeline. Do you want one of those? Yeah, have one later. Let's finish the review first. So good. Everything feels well screwed together, but as I say, in terms of the plastics, yes, they are a little bit hard and, and, and scratchy feeling, but they're well built uh, and they feel like they're going to last the way. Right, let me move on to what 
I don't really like, which is this media screen up here. Now this controls pretty much everything here. So as you can see, you've got your radio, you've got your vehicle settings uh, in here where you can put things like you know your active brake, your blind spot monitoring, as I said, that's on there. I mean, don't get me wrong, it, it sort of all works in terms of being able to sort of like, you know, control it. It's nice and basic. There's not too much to go through. You know, once you kind of set things up, um, you know, like how you want them, like your Bluetooth and your actual display system and then the actual car system itself, you know, whether you want the units in miles per hour or kilometres, all that kind of thing. It, it, you know, it's all there, it's easy to use. What it has is integrated Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. And as you can see, it's wired. Um, so, you know, I connect my iPhone up and, and I use, I always use Apple CarPlay, I think it's great. So using kind of Google Maps or Waze is fantastic. But I would say now, 60% of the time I've been using it, for some reason, it just disconnects it. And you've got to wait. You've got to pull the cable out, wait for a while, put it back in and then try and reconnect it. I don't think it's as good as it should be. Now, I get the fact somebody's going to turn around and say, well, what do you expect for the price? I'll tell you what, I expect more for the price. Because I've got a standalone kind of Chinese non-branded unit in my Mini Countryman at home. And it works, and it's wireless, and it works a lot better than this. So I'm a bit disappointed with that, I have to say. I like the kind of basic functionality and how easy it is to actually use, but the reliability of the connectivity seems to let it down. So that's the one thing that I have to say within the interior that I've, I found disappointing. Um, you get a four speaker stereo system in the um, expression mode, which this one is. If you move up to the extreme, it's a six speaker uh, audio system. Um, and as I say, obviously you get radio and you get media connectivity, but you've got to, um, you've got to either, if you're not using Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, you can Bluetooth the music. But if you want to use your Spotify and things, you've got to have it hardwired in. And I just think it's not, it hasn't been reliable enough for me. Um, in that sense for want to use it, especially when you're using the navigation for instance and you're trying to find you know the little towns that you want to down here in Cornwall um, and you don't I don't really know the area I know it well but not well enough I still want to rely on that it just kind of lets me down a little bit so that's that's what I've found uh, annoying other than that it's been a great interior it's well built it's uh, got enough storage it's comfortable as I say we've had seven of us in the car driving around and nobody has complained about being uncomfortable so from that point of view again the functionality and usability of it it's an absolute winner um, but as I say that would be better I tell you what I'd be more tempted if I was Dacia to do almost do like what Volkswagen did with a little up and scored with the city go have a, a um, and Fiat think do it as well with the 500 the basic 500 have it so that your smartphone is the media just have a, a cradle to clip your smartphone in and wire it in and then just use that that either that or improve that Dacia because that's the only thing that I've been disappointed with at the inside of the car otherwise can't fault it right time to get technical 1.6 litre petrol engine from Renault fitted uh, alongside it is an electric motor there is a second electric motor which is in the gearbox a four-speed gearbox um, and that will assist the in other words when you start the car off it drives off an electric power before the engine actually cuts in um, which in fairness you don't really notice it's quite nice though the transition between the electric motor and the combustion engine um, it's quite a seamless kind of uh, thing through this system is used in Renault's Clio and the Capture as well so that's where it's going to come from um, and also that other electric motor will fill in gaps um, so you know when, when there's a gear shift taking place there's no drop in power so it's it, it's said to be quite kind of seamless it's not perfect however but we will talk about that when we're out driving it and I'll explain why in terms of power output you're looking at 140 horsepower combined um, between combustion and electric motor as well and um, which is more than enough you know not to 60s I think it's around about sort of like 10 seconds you, you know it's a seven seat family car and in fairness as well loaded up with people and stuff like we've had uh, this week it doesn't take its toll on the car it doesn't feel particularly underpowered so that's what I will say about it so don't have a fear about that um, Dacia say that you should get um, on a combined cycle around about 57 miles to the gallon out of the car uh, and that's roughly an equivalent of I think the, the petrol the one litre triple uh, cylinder one is around about 49 miles to the gallon so there is an increase over that but bear in mind you've got to pay more for the hybrid so you've got to work out is that going to be is that sort of like premium for the hybrid going to equate itself to the better fuel economy that you're going to see only you can decide that um, 
I've seen on my time with the car 47 miles to the gallon on average, which I think is outstanding. You know, as I say, I've driven down from Surrey to Cornwall. It's about 300 miles. I've been using the car this week. I still haven't put petrol in it. Um, so it's doing really, really well as far as I'm concerned. So in terms of, you know, sort of like a, a full tank, what are you going to see out of it? I would say you're probably looking at around about 500 miles out of a tank if you're kind of relatively light on your throttle. Uh, interestingly, Dacia also say that you could potentially see up to 80% of your driving in the urban environment purely on electric power alone um, and it will drive at reasonable speeds it's not like a, a Lexus hybrid that'll only do up to sort of like you know a few miles an hour before the engine kicks in you could be driving at 30 40 miles an hour on pure EV power alone so I have to say I think it's a good system in principle in practice it isn't perfect but as I say we will talk about that when we're out driving the car right so the Jogger Hybrid 140, as I say, it has a 1.6 litre petrol engine with an electric motor to the side of that and another smaller electric motor in the gearbox. Um, when you start the car, 99% of the time it will move off in electric only mode, so this is pretty much in EV mode now. As I say, the whole setup combined is 140 horsepower, 0 to 60. 10.1 seconds. It's about a second quicker than the TCE 110, which obviously, as you can imagine, is 110 horsepower from a one litre three cylinder petrol engine. Now, the, that's the one that gets a manual gearbox. In the hybrid, you've only got this four speed auto, which I'm going to talk about when we get out on the road now. So I'm just coming out the junction now. I can just squeeze out. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, madam. Um, on the whole, under a light throttle, the car drives very, very well. There's, there's no denying that it's, it's quite nice. And the transition between where the motor stops, where the electric drive stops, and the combustion engine comes in is pretty seamless. You can't really tell. Unless I'm looking at the dashboard now, it comes up and says EV. Um, that's when I know I'm in electric only mode and then as I say when that disappears the engines kicked in So as I say you can't there's no jolt in the drive line. There's no particular uh, telltale signal um, Too much if you're on a light throttle that you're, you're, you've, you've, you've gone from electric power into combustion power That's the one thing that is quite nice about it. You, you, the, the brakes, you can add regenerative braking. So the battery, you don't need to plug in, as I say. There's a hybrid that, that basically charges off the engine. Um, you can also add to that by bringing the gear lever back from the D into B, where there is an element of uh, brake regen. It's not one pedal driving, but there's certainly more sort of like um, energy recuperated from the, the braking system um, that feeds power into the battery. And you get the battery meter on the left-hand side so you can see that working quite well. The bit where it kind of just falls apart for me a little bit is where we're about to go now. So we're just coming down into Porth Town and I'm just going to go up um, the cliff road here. Um, so if I, when we come out of the 30 mile an hour zone, if I want to sort of like apply a bit of power to it, let me just, I don't know if you'll be able to pick this up in the microphone, but here we go. So there's the engine kicked in. Because it's a four speed box, it doesn't, it, it's not the best really. You know, again, foot down, oh, that was my tripod, foot down, and it just feels a little bit harsh. The engine's not a particularly nice engine, in fairness, the 1.6 litre Renault engine. It's all right, it does the job, but it's not a kind of melodic unit. You know, it just, it's a bit coarse in some respects. And because it's just that four speed auto, it just makes itself known a little bit too much, a little bit too long, if that makes sense. It's almost like a CVT gearbox. It's almost like that. That's how it feels. Like it's, hey, come on, up shift, up shift. Eventually it does, you know. See? Come on, up shift. There we go. There it's up shift. That's my problem with it. So, 99% of the time, or 95% of the time, if I'm being honest about it, um, the car is very, very smooth when it's under a light throttle. As soon as you start to push down, maybe joining the motorway, you've gone down a slip road and you're trying to get up to speed or you're pulling out to overtake, say, a tractor or slow and moving traffic on roads like this, it, the engine really makes itself known to you. And, and that's the bit I'm struggling with a little bit. A, I, and I think the blame is to lie at the gearbox. It's the four-speed box. I think if it was a six-speed box that they could match to, it would just be that little bit better. 
that's my issue okay otherwise in terms of the drive of the car it drives really really well it drives nicely as i say that transition from electric but it's just going back to electric power now and i'm doing 40 miles an hour so because i'm under a light throttle load it, it, it moves it back to the electric power it's really good and you don't really notice it until you put your foot down and that's when it becomes a little bit oh i'm not quite sure so that's my that's my wee bit i'd really like to drive the tc 110 before i turn around and say this is worth the money the extra premium over that car um oh, that's the bit i'm kind of struggling with a little bit right that's the, that's the only thing I can really criticise the car for in terms of the way it drives. Its performance is good, even with um, seven people in the car with lots of luggage in the back, we've been absolutely fine with it. It has not struggled at all. It keeps up with, more, you know, it keeps up with traffic, it's fine on the motorway, it's great around these little roads. What's really nice about it is we've got a Jeep Grand Cherokee which is also down here with us. We've not used it this week at all. Well, my wife's just gone out in it today, to be fair, while I'm doing this. But what's nice is, because this is, it feels like quite a small car until you look behind you. This is a really nice, easy car to place on some of these little lanes, you know, and through some of the little villages and towns which are really quite tight. So in terms of manoeuvrability, um, the jogger's brilliant, really very good, really very good. So yeah, so I do like that about it. Um, steering, steering's nice. Steering does the job, it turns the wheels. The wheel is a nice shape, it's a nice size, you've got a good driving position, it's a good relationship uh, between me, the seat, the pedals, the ste steering wheel, you know, and good visibility around you, even over the shoulder, is excellent visibility. Good big rear window, that's the benefit of having that real kind of flat back to the car. You've got a good rear window, which you see, you can good visibility at the back of, and it's very, very easy just to kind of reverse the car up to, um, you, you know, a, a, like in a tight parking space. And we were in a, a, a multi-storey car park the other day in Truro. Um, really, really easy just to back the car up, um, you know, rather than just kind of relying on the cameras and, and the reversing sensors. It was easy to see behind you and just back the car up to the wall. Brilliant, can't complain at all. And the mirrors are excellent as well. You know, you get the blind spot monitoring on them, the little orange indicator light comes up with the blind spot monitoring, all good. The brakes themselves um, have a relatively good feel about them. The, you know, the, they're relatively sharp. You stand on the pedal, there's a good feel. It's a good progressive feel. The problem then comes when you're moving off again. That's when you get that engine kicking in again. It just, yeah, it's just that little bit course for me if I'm being fair it just I'd like something a bit smoother almost right quality good part and due to two things uh, good long wheelbase um, and decent profile on tires you know the 16 inch wheels they've not gone silly on the alloy wheels of the car um, so there is a very good um, ride quality from the vehicle you do feel harsher imperfections like big potholes uh, and certain things, so they, they, they do make themselves known. See, look, I'm doing 54 miles an hour in electric power, in EV mode, and you don't know it. There's the engine kick back in, only because the light's gone out again. It's brilliant. Um, what was I talking about? Ride quality, yeah, so if you, you hit a pothole, a drain cover, it does make itself known through the car, but not in a truly uncomfortable way. Handling's good, handling's all right, it's better than sort of like being in a slightly taller crossover because you've got a lower centre of gravity. Um, so maybe something like a Renault Capture, uh, you know, Vauxhall, uh, Crossland, Grandland, whatever they call them. You know, it's probably slightly better than that because as I say, you don't have such a tall centre of gravity. You're a bit lower to the ground, so that does work in its favour. Um, so the handling is good. But don't get me wrong, this isn't a car that you're going to get up at six o'clock on a Sunday morning and head off to your favourite B road while the family's still asleep. It's not that. But it's good. It handles itself well. As I say, the manoeuvrability is what's the nice part about it. There's a vagueness to the steering on the dead ahead, but only the dead ahead. The rest of it, the rest of the time, it works just absolutely fine. So on the whole, in terms of the drive of the car, there's good and bad. The good bit, as I say, is the smoothness of the transition between the, the electric motor and the engine. Um, it has to be commended. I really, really got that done right, I think. There's enough power 
Um, you know, 140 horsepower is enough for this size of car. Any more, of course it would be welcome, but it's not needed. As I say, my only downside with it, and I think it is probably more the geared box, is that when you put your foot down, is how kind of coarse that it can feel, is that vocality of its engine, if that's even a word. It just makes itself known just a little bit too much for my liking. And I'm not sure that whilst the economy is better with the vehicle, I'm not sure for that, that sort of like slight increase in economy, so as a cyclist just gone past me, that slight increase in economy is enough to take away from that harshness of when you put your foot down and you get that sort of like vocal engine coming into play. As I say, if it had more ratios in the gearbox, it would probably be better. But as it is, it doesn't. But that is the only thing that I can genuinely really find fault with, albeit is quite a big thing. But does that detract from the rest of the car? Let's find out. So we've spoken about how it looks, we've spoken about how practical it is, we've spoken about what it's like to drive, but if all of this still tickles your pickle, what you need to know is how much it's going to cost you. Well, it comes in two trim levels, so you don't get the basic essential trim uh, if you go for the hybrid model like you do if you go for the pure petrol one. So it starts with this one, which is the Expression at 22,995, which is roughly about £3,000 more than the equivalent model in that TCE 110 petrol engine car. And if you go for the Extreme, that is 23995 and there is a plethora of options that you can add on to that depending maybe what you want to do in terms of your lifestyle. As I say, you can have a, a sleep pack, you can have a, a, a rear tent thing and all the rest of it. I mean, I specced one up the other night while sitting down at our Airbnb in the extreme model um, and even then it was still with everything that I would put on it, still under £25,000, which I think is incredible value for money. I don't want to trivialise money because twenty five grand is still a lot of cash to a lot of people. But still, for the amount of car that you get, for what you can add on to it, these days that's not a huge amount. Now is it worth it over the petrol engine equivalent? Well, as I say, it depends how you use the car. Would you see the benefit of that extra economy? The other, the other thing you might be thinking of maybe from an, uh, a company car point of view, in terms of the emissions that the car puts out, the TCE 110 is 130 grams per kilometre, whereas the hybrid drops down to 110 grams per kilometre, so that might also have a bearing um, on your decision. And of course, when it comes to warranty, you still just get the standard three-year warranty with the vehicle, whereas some of the other manufacturers that are coming into this market sector, such as MG, uh, obviously Hyundai and Kia, albeit they're a bit more expensive, but they do offer much greater warranties. So. Is it, more, is it worth the money? As I say, only you can really decide that whether it's worth it over the petrol engine or not. Well, in terms of price, what else could you potentially be looking at if you were looking at the Jogger? Well, as I say, it's a very difficult car to pigeonhole because it's not kind of one thing or the other. It's not really an estate car. It's not really a, an SUV crossover. It's not really a, an MPV. It's I don't really know what it is, but whatever it is, is there anything out there that could compete with it? Well, I think if you're buying the Jogger, then you're looking at the space. That's your primary reason, space and perhaps by the value that it offers you. So if you're looking at smaller seven-seat cars, then it's maybe things like the Peugeot Rifter, uh, Citroen Berlingo, and of course the Vauxhall Combo, which is another car that is spun off that uh, platform. And they obviously offer do they offer a full electric model in those, but they are a lot more expensive. That's the downside there. Is it an estate car? And if you is an estate car, what else could you look at? Well, of course, there's things like the Toyota Corolla Hybrid, uh, the Suzuki Swayce, which is its obviously kind of compatriot there, maybe an MG5, but of course, you get the estate car bit, but you don't get the seven seats. And again, they're a bit more expensive. Um, maybe there's the smaller kind of crossovers that you'd look at. Renault Capture, which obviously is, you know, uses a lot of the technology from that car. Ford Puma, uh, Volkswagen T-Roc, but again, you're losing out on the practicality of the estate and the seven seats. So in many ways, it really does stand on its own. There are some cars that are very desirable because of how basic they are at just doing a job and doing it well. The Fiat Panda, both the original and the new one, is a prime example of that. The Suzuki Jimny, the Land Rover Defender, the old one, not the new chintzy thing, but the old model. Uh, the Skoda Yeti, that was another car that I think it just it was just a good car and it just did everything it needed to do. And I think we've now got another one to add to the list, which is the Jogger. I genuinely have been 
pleasantly surprised how good this car has been. My family were quite shocked when I told them how much this car actually cost. Many of them thought because of you know the, the hybrid technology, the space on offer, the standard equipment, just the way the car looks, it's a good looking car. A lot of them thought it was going to be 30, 40,000 pounds plus. When I turned around and said, you know, it's 23,000 pounds, they were genuinely shocked. Is it worth going for the hybrid, however? Because as I say, you do have that premium of about £3,000 over the standard TCE 110. Well, that's really going to be down to yourself because that premium that you're paying for the hybrid, you're not immediately seeing back in the economy. There is a better economy, but it's not night and day, dare I suggest. And it's not perfect. As I say, that although the, the, the transition between electric to, to, to petrol engine is quite smooth, it's not a particularly great engine, and I'm not convinced the four-speed gearbox is the answer to it. So would it be better with a three-cylinder manual? Well, I have to be honest and say that's going to be down to your own personal choice at that point. For me, it just loses out on greatness because of that, but that's not to say it's not a car that I can't stand here and fully recommend. I sent a picture of it to a friend of mine the other day and he said, the real test is, Brian, would you buy one with your own money? And the answer is yes, I really would. This is a great car. If you just want a proper, spacious, versatile, cheap to buy, cheap to run, good value for money, non-pretentious family car, this is it. A bit like fish and chips on the beach down there in Port Town. It would appear basic really is best. Thank you for watching another episode of House of Cars on our new car review. As I say, this is quite a new channel, so if you are new to us, thank you for taking the time to watch. If you would be so kind, make sure you are subscribed. And once you've done that, press the little bell button that is down below because that way you'll be notified of when our next video goes live. It's not just going to be car reviews that we do here. We're going to do new car reviews. We're going to tell stories about other cars. We're going to do a bit more kind of ins and outs of things. So if you're into cars, this is the place to be. Uh, leave me some comments down below as well. So what are your thoughts on it? Have you enjoyed the review? You think it's too long? Well, tell me, tell me what you think. We're trying to aim this at people who are actually buying cars. So if you do into buying cars, and I say that's why we do these slightly longer reviews, giving a bit more detail than some of the other channels that are also out there for your viewing pleasure. If you're into electric cars, remember there's Auto EV, that's my other channel where we view purely electric stuff. So if that's your bag, that's where you need to head. Auto EV is electric cars. House of Cars is going to be for other non-electric cars. Um, and there's a little bit of social media going on now. I'm on Instagram, House of Cars, uh, 1973. Don't ask why, but I'm sure you can guess. Uh, so give me a follow there too, because that's going to be quite a nice sort of like little thing that helps the channel as well. Um, thank you for joining me. Thank you for supporting me. And uh, I'm sorry if it's been a bit windy up here, but it is a beautiful day, as you can see in sunny Cornwall. Downside is, tomorrow we drive home. Thankfully, in this. I'll see you again soon. Finley, come on, boy, come on.